Hello, Miguel. Hope you're doing well. So let's see here. All right, yeah, nice to nice to somewhat see you, Miguel, and hear from you. It's great to have you. Um, I'm probably going to give you 10 points as opposed to five uh, for showing up today. And I'm going to share the page, right, uh, with the assignment uh, as well as with you. And we are looking at the, um, the North Americano Goliath, right? The North American uh, Goliath versus, you know, the David of, of Mexico uh, in the... Um, in the 19th century. And so what we do is you could you could kind of do a, a, a story of two cities, right? A tale of two cities and, and do it in the form of a contrast where one is um, experiencing a lot of, um, of, of drama, discord, um, civil strife, um, uh, just being in, in, having progress impeded so to speak. And of course, I'm, I'm speaking of, of, of Mexico. And then the United States just growing exponentially. Um, and sadly, right, that's how the, the narrative starts. And, and thank goodness, this doesn't always prevail in, in every historical narrative, this Darwinian theme that, you know, if you're big and strong enough to bully somebody else, you do it inevitably. Uh, but sadly, that's somewhat the way the narrative goes for the United States uh, in Mexico uh, on this topic. Um, for one, right, as I've mentioned before in a previous assignment, uh, the United States is going to kick the can down the road for other future generations to have to tackle fundamental issues like the color line, right, how they're going to treat African Americans, for instance. And so in not addressing those major issues, they could, they could derive a, a momentary false sense of, of unity, of, of peace, uh, not tackling that issue by just kind of putting it under the rug and just ignoring the elephant in the room. And of course, eventually it's gonna bite them in the rear, right? Like in the, in the time of the civil war and reconstruction and so forth. Uh, they're going to have that issue kind of thrown up at them uh, in a very harmful, uh, you know, um, staggering manner. But until then, like I said, they just push the problem down the road for, for future generations uh, to handle. And so on the contrast to that, right, you have a guy named Marshall Eakin, uh, E-A-K-I-N. And Marshall Eakin has a book uh, whereby he contends that in, in Mexico and these other areas of Latin America, they took those issues on. They were not afraid of taking on such issues. And they, um, they incurred the short-term costs of doing such. So for instance, take a look here. Um, Within Mexico, between its independence in 1821 and the end of the Mexican-American War in 1848, the nation had experienced at least six constitutions, nearly two dozen administrations, four coups, and attempted foreign invasion twice. And, uh, and then you see here as well, um, so you have that, that sentence here. Let me put that in red as well. Um, but then over here, I quote Marshall Eakin in his book, and look at here. In Costa Rica, Brazil, and Chile, stable governments were established quickly and successfully, and the liberals wanting to end colonial institutions, privileges, and give constitutional rights, economic opportunities, and local autonomy to the people and conservatives um, managed to avoid civil war. 
However, in Mexico and Peru, civil wars, coups, and multiple revolutions, largely between conservatives and liberals, racked their countries, deepened their debts, retarded their economic and commercial growth, and promoted militarism and caudillism, deemed by many to lead to authoritarianism. Caudillism is following one caudillo, a man of horseback, one individual, um, instead of a, a political platform, right? Uh, or, or a political party, uh, you follow one, one, you know, um, one hombre, one, one gentleman. And that's going to happen. It, there's a tendency for that to happen uh, in Latin America. Um, also, uh, you have the, the famous letters, the Jamaica letters. Uh, those are interesting, uh, written by um, Simone Bolivar, who was like the, the George Washington of South America, okay? And Simone Bolivar, what he wrote here, right, is he says, don't put the type of government that is theoretically or morally uh, the best option, but simply do what works best. Because he had become disillusioned. He at one time had traveled to France, to revolutionary France, and um, he had a very uh, enlightened tutor named Ramon Rodriguez, and um, he was very idealistic when he was younger, wanting to improve the world, follow the French Enlightenment, uh, equality, fraternity, right? Um, and so at any rate, he wanted to do that until he ran into problems in Latin America. Uh, he could not beat the Spanish forces. Uh, some of the indigenous people under Jose Tomas Boves uh, fought against him. And here he is trying to fight for them on behalf of, of, of uh, you know, South American independence. And he became embittered. And he said, you know what? What you need to do is just have a strong-handed government. And uh, there are too many differences ethnically, uh, regionally, um, economically, culturally, et cetera, uh, in, within South America and places like you know, Chile and, and, and uh, Argentina and Venezuela and, and uh, Colombia. And so he said, basically, you, we need to rule them by an iron hand, force them into a confederacy, um, whether they want to or not. And of course, that, that, that's, it was riddled with Napoleonic references too, like Napoleon's uh, code, his enlightened code. But the point is, right, is the people in Latin America, they took the issues on. They wanted equality of opportunity for the indigenous, for negros, uh, for, for esclavos, for slaves, right? Um, they, they took these, these controversial issues on. Whereas when you look back in North America with the gringos, uh, they won't take that on, right? They kick it to the side and say, well, we'll let each state decide on citizenship. And what do you know, each state uh, just rendered it only available to white property owning men. And then gradually in the 1820s and 30s, they granted it to non-property owning white men. Uh, but that's not very bold, right? But in the short run, it, it, it makes for, for um, stability, right? And so the, the American Goliath was able to grow partly because the Americans did not have the boldness and, and the idealism that, that was found in Latin America in such numbers uh, to take major issues on, which caused, unfortunately, uh, different coups, right? A C-O-U-P, a coup is a blow to the state, right? Where someone forces uh, the people in charge uh, out out and and puts himself in 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 place of that uh revolutions right it's supposed to be 180 degree uh change uh politically and economically and socially um so revolutions are kind of difficult to have but there there were definitely revolutions in latin america um uh scrapped constitutions whereby one party come in and, and, and issue a constitution. Like in Mexico, it was 1824 constitution, very liberal, very enlightened, uh, political equality, uh, set the stage for an end to slavery uh, a, a decade later. 
um, long before the U.S. did. And um, but then it was abrogated. It was done away with. It was ignored by Anastasio Bustamante, and it was basically changed by Santa Ana uh, in his Siete Leyes and then Basis Organicas uh, constitutions that he named. So at any rate, the U.S. has more stability in the short run, but not for all the right reasons. Um, and then the states, uh, the Supreme Court created uh, an environment that was conducive to business development. Uh, so McCulloch versus Maryland, it, it, uh, it gave implied powers to the federal government. And so you see them flexing their muscle with this with the Bank of the United States. There's nothing in the Constitution that states that we could have a national bank, right? But we do nevertheless. And now, like today, with our Federal Reserve System, et cetera. And so um, uh, Gibbons versus Ogden, the right for uh, Congress to regulate interstate commerce or trade. And so uh, there was a, a gentleman named, um, oh, goodness, don't let me forget uh, his name. Marshall, right here, I have a, a book here, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, uh, he is going to um, be the Supreme Court Justice, the Chief Justice, that issues a lot of major decisions that gave a lot of power to the federal government as opposed to the states, and gave a lot of leeway to um, businesses uh, to do their thing. So supposedly he was single-handedly uh, very much a part of just creating a business-friendly environment in the United States. Then the states, right? Don't forget that the states, right, uh, began to uh, develop infrastructure. And you have that in a basic uh, textbook on, uh, on American history, uh, Alan Brinkley, his American history. And you have a chapter completely on that um, of the uh, states uh, issuing bond drives, right? Uh, borrowing money from citizens and promising to pay them back with interest. Uh, a lot of bond initiatives, et cetera, to build uh, canals. Uh, and then later um, um, railroads uh, through, their, through their states, right? And so that is gonna really, um, kick in the and incentivize uh, the process of, of commerce, of trading between one region and another, right? Uh, evidently, it greatly affects the price of a product, how long and costly the process is of getting it from A to B to a market. And when you facilitate that by way of a railroad, et cetera, it greatly, greatly cuts the cost and incentivizes you to to uh, to want to trade uh, and and produce something at point A and sell it at point B, etc. So the states had kind of uh, uh, were kind of progressive uh, in the antebellum period before the Civil War, the 1820s through 1850s, according to Alan Brinkley in his textbook, uh, were um, were pretty progressive and proactive in developing infrastructure. Then you also have what I didn't put in here is the role of immigrants. Uh, you know, Samuel Slater, uh, these uh, John Jacob Astor, all these different immigrants served very um, uh, well at, as entrepreneurs, as business beginners, as business owners, etc., cetera, and, um, and bringing technology with them all the way up through Carnegie um, with steel in the Bessemer oven that made steel from the British Isles. So a lot of immigrants are going to come in, uh, in particular, uh, a lot of Germans um, are going to come in uh, just before the Civil War. And of course, the Irish are going to be more known for working as the proletariat, as the manual laborers in the in industrializing uh, economy, right, to do the backbreaking, uh, poorly paid work uh, but that someone needs to do. So you have the Irish and the Germans in particular during the antebellum or before the Civil, before the Civil War era of 1830s through 1850s, because of course the Civil War was 1861 to 65. 
And so um, let's see here. Uh, then you have uh, the United States flexing its muscles with the federal domain. And so you have the, uh, I mean, you see there in white, that was the Louisiana Purchase by, uh, by uh, Thomas Jefferson in 1803. So nearly doubled the size of the country at that time uh, in purchasing that territory. 1806, uh, you know, he's going to send Lewis and Clark, and then he's going to send um, uh, uh, Zebulon Pike. And uh, later on, of course, um, very famously was uh, John C. Fremont and others who were going to travel across through the topographical crew of the armed forces and, and uh, engage in basically spying out the land. Uh, and as far as the flora and fauna, the animal and plant life, uh, the geological conditions, but also Native Americans and who was going to be friendly to U.S. involvement and who was going to likely be hostile to U.S. involvement in their lands. And so uh, it, it reads a little bit like a pre, um, pre-conquest um, journal, uh, what you read from like Lewis and Clark, etc. So at any rate, you have that. You have the War of 1812, and they took lands and consolidated the Northwest Ordinance lands around the Great Lakes. Uh, so like present day, uh, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, uh, they took those by the end of the War of 1812. They uh, took Mississippi, Alabama, um, and, um, and then Florida by 1819 uh, from Spain and from the Red Stick Native Americans. And they're, we're going to get into that next week as far as popular prejudice against Native Americans and so forth. But I just kind of go over the general facts on the Trail of Tears, right? Uh, the Cherokee, Choctaw, uh, and other uh, five uh, civilized tribes that they, they issued eminent domain laws against them, saying you have to sell your land to the state uh, for the public good. And they took it to the Supreme Court and actually won with a lawyer named William Wirt uh, and contending that, hey, a federal treaty of Ashota had granted that land to the Cherokee and a mere state law that, that dictates they have to sell that land uh, is, is trumped by a federal treaty. That, that They made it about power, right? That what the federal government says uh, trumps what a state says. And they actually won in the Supreme Court case. And then President Andrew Jackson said, you know, um, they made their decision. Now let's see him enforce it. And he openly defied the decision of the Supreme Court as president and sent in soldiers and, 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 and had the, the Native Americans forced from those lands uh, into Arkansas and Oklahoma. So at any rate, um, yeah, and then the story of Mexican Texas. Uh, have you had a chance to read this, Miguel? So um, last semester I took a, a Chicano literature class. Oh, all right. We actually kind of covered some, uh, a little bit of Mexican American history. All right. As, um, uh, as uh, Texas and the Treaty of Guadalupe. Yeah, so, yeah. Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All right. Yeah, so I'm a little familiar about it, but um, it's very interesting and. Yeah, it is. Although I have not uh, had a chance to read your specific document yet. Oh, OK, no problem. I'll get to it. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay. Well, just, uh, you know, some of the main things in, in, in the narrative, right, are the fact of, uh, of course, the liberality of, of the laws. I mean, look at this. Um, 4,000 acres of free land per family, right? And all that is asked of them is that they become Roman Catholic, uh, learn the Spanish language, abide by Mexican law, right? Uh, after a certain grace period of not having to pay taxes, eventually pay taxes, right? And, um, and they can't even do that, according to uh, Mier y Teran, right? Uh, he comes in with his expedition, and he notices that the Americans are in many ways and in, in many areas 
outnumbering the Tejanos, the, the ethnic Mexican Texans, uh, by 10 to 1. And he says, right, that they are independent and haughty. And, of course, haughty, right, is arrogant. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, haughty is, is, is it, yeah, you're, you're arrogant. You don't feel like the laws apply to you. You could do as you please, et cetera, right? And um, so, yeah, so you have that going on with the, with the commission. And um, let's see here. So they issue the April 6th colonization law of 1830. And this makes it much more difficult for uh, extranjeros, right, foreigners to make it into Texas uh, without the proper passports, et cetera. Um, it um, declares that anyone that is illegally in possession of a slave is to have that slave taken from him and even uh, possibly uh, deported from Mexican Texas uh, for violation of, of the laws of the land uh, because both the federal and the state level, uh, uh, Coahuila y Texas together as a state, right? Uh, they issued in their state constitution uh, law against slavery as well. And so they were clearly in violation of that, the, the, the Norte Americanos uh, in this region under Stephen Austin and his father before that, Moses Austin received it. Um, so at any rate, uh, at that point, um, you have uh, the, the imposition of Stephen Austin into the, di into the dialogue uh, going down to Mexico uh, to try to talk them out of the April 6th colonization law or to try to get them to make some type of, of, um, of compromise. And by then the presidency had switched from Bustamante to Gomez Farias. And supposedly there was a bit of a, uh, just a, a personal conflict uh, of, of incompatibility between Gomez Farias and Stephen Austin. In many ways, they were they were similar. Uh, they they claimed to be very they claimed to be like erudites, uh, much more educated and polished and civilized than the people around them. And so uh, there might have been a little bit of an ego clash or something. But but we know that um, that before then, right? Uh, you know, the narrative it doesn't fit into a completely neat story of villainous gringos and victim Hispanics uh, when it comes to uh, Stephen Austin early. Uh, so for instance, you had the, um, a couple brothers who rose uh, in, in what they called the a Fredonian revolt, F-R-E-D-O-N-I-A-N. Uh, -E and they tried to, um, to implement a, uh, a revolution and um, Stephen Austin himself fought against them uh, and helped squash that rebellion. Uh, when he went to Gomez Farias, he contended that he was for, um, you know, just trying to implement a compromise, but that his, his um, you know, on multiple occasions, he asked for more reinforcements of, of further soldiers against defiant gringos in his, in his region that he said, he didn't always have the military power to keep in check, uh, but actually sought help from the Mexican government. But we know that this is going to, um, uh, his, his writings, his primary sources, his um, position uh, in the, the narrative all change at this point when Gomez Farias has him um, arrested, uh, contends that, he threatened uh, uh, treasonous um, remarks, uh, contending that if they didn't uh, if they didn't change some part of the April six colonization law, that Mexico was going to lose Texas, and he was powerless to stop it. And so, at any rate, he was um, he was put in a prison, and at that point, he sends a letter to the Cabildo, the City Council of San Antonio, and at that point, he says that you know. Uh, the Mexican government is, is not willing to compromise. 
Uh, they are a mess. Um, I've lost respect for them. And please do whatever you deem necessary at this point. And so, you know, you wander at that point. The same thing with William Barrett Travis, who issued his manifesto from the Alamo, right? And he says, uh, you know, liberty loving Americans, we have this Latino tyrant, um, Jose Lopez de Santa Ana, right? And, um, and he's taken away our rights, et cetera, et cetera. My point being is that at one point, they contended, uh, William Barrett Travis, and especially Stephen Austin, they contended that their loyalty was to Mexico and that they found themselves within the dialogue of Mexican politics between the liberals and the conservatives. The liberals were federalists. They wanted more states' rights. They didn't want a unitary, strong central government. Uh, they, they, they were kind of old school libertarian liberals. Uh, they wanted to keep government small and unobtrusive into your lives and allow people from day to day uh, and keep it localized, uh, et cetera. And so at any rate, you know, the Federalists versus the Centralists, that was part of, of Mexican political discourse everywhere. Uh, to the point of having civil wars, right, with Benito Juarez later on, et cetera, right, the conservatives versus the liberals. And so, um, you know, at, at that point, but then when, when, the, when it really hits the fan, so to speak, when, when, when the drama arises and it's conflict time, they, they issue these kind of racist remarks, right? That you know that that generally uh, that they are applying on a general stereotypical level, and so like I said with 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 Stephen Austin, he says that the the Mexican people down here they um, they don't know how to govern well, they're they're all over the place. It's chaotic. They they can't be depended upon. They're mercurial, and mercurial is like your your bipolar. Um, but he makes it out a be as an essentialist thing almost that Mexican the Mexican people are just that way, and same thing with William Barrett Travis. It's not just that Santa Ana is a tyrant because there were a lot of ethnic Mexicans who thought that Santa Ana was a tyrant uh, by the mid 1830s, right? Uh, who followed Gomez Farias in the liberal tradition, and Vicente Guerrero, and that type of old school liberalism. Um, but instead, right, William Barrett Travis says, you know, he makes it out to be kind of racist. And, you know, it's just one of the many questions I have is at what point did that rear its ugly head? Is, is there something innate in human beings? Is there something that was conscious consciously existing in American political tradition, in American culture, right? In American institutions like the family and the school and the government, et cetera, is what made it out to be racist and when? Was it all fake and phony when the Mexican people invited them into California and invited them into Texas? And they, they you know, were they, uh, they thought, okay, right off the bat, subconsciously, these are a different, uh, inferior people. You know, I think of Richard Henry Dana, who was in California, and he writes this wonderful book two years before the mast, right, um, about his, his travels across, you know, Mexican California, et cetera, and what a beautiful place it was and how well-cultured the Californios were the ethnic Mexican Californians. But then he just drops that, that bomb and says, oh, if only such a place as this were in the hands of a more enterprising people like us, like the Norte Americanos, like the gringos. If, if Texas or if California were only in the hands of someone more enterprising like we are, just imagine the potential of that state. And like I said, I just, 
you know, I, I'm asking a question that I don't have an answer to, but, you know, uh, uh, sociology, psychology, um, religious studies, right? Um, all kinds of different disciplines have, have gotten their feet wet on that one, right? As right. to what, ex what extent uh, is, is it innate in human beings or is it taught? And if, and if it could be learned, the good news is, right, is it could be unlearned, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, but to what extent is it innate in us uh, to, to make the, uh, the proverbial psycholo the psychologies other, right? When you put someone in that other category, to what extent do we do that naturally? To what extent was it more uh, likely that 19th century Americans living under those institutions at that time uh, were, were taught to be racist? So at any rate, because when you look at the at Santa Ana's law, right, in Chicano histor his historical accounts, right, the gringos are, are defiant ingrates. They come in, they get all this land, they have little asked of them, and they can't even do that. Then, so then Mexico takes the stand, um, and they and and now their their feathers are ruffled because they can't follow their id, they can't follow their their selfish desires and what they want, right? And get what they want. So now they're of course they're looking for uh, one more pretext, one more uh, so-called excuse uh, to rebel. And of course they find it with the Siete Leyes, with the Seven Laws Constitution, uh, Santa Ana. He uh, handpicks the governors instead of them being elected. Um, he has the power to shut down the Diputacion, the Congress, as well as state legislators. Um, it really was very, very uber conservative uh, to the point of being a little scary. Um, but, but then again, right, before he traveled to Texas, uh, Coahuila, and, you know, uh, located the capital located down in, I think, to this day in Saltillo, right? They, um, they made an initial stand just like Zacatecas did with, under its governor and said, we won't abide by this Siete Leyes constitution, right? But when he came to get militarily involved to squash it, Saltillo stepped down. Zacatecas was defeated. Um, not necessarily stepping down, but was defeated militarily. And by the time the troops got up here, it just seemed like a strange coincidence, a correlation, right? Uh, two things that, to me, right, correlation is two things that are coexisting, but not necessarily one causing the other, but maybe. Um, but the fact that those who refused to put their their guns down and and decided that they weren't going to be deterred by the threat of Santa Ana's army coming for them uh, happened to be the gringos. And a lot of the ethnic Tejanos stepped down by the time of the Alamo. So of course, right? I mean, the, the exceptions are so few that we know their names, right? Uh, Juan and Erasmo Seguin became famous as ethnic Tejanos uh, who fought um, against Santa Ana and for the, the Texas cause of a free Texas. Uh, but again, right, we know their names because there's so few. The number, uh, almost everyone else was a gringo who fought. And so what could be seen, and of course, when you ask the gringos, they're not going to be overt about it, even back then. They're contending, hey, we want to return to the liberal constitution of 1824. They had that at the Alamo, right? Uh, signs and banners and flags. We want to return to the, the, to the federal constitution of 1824. Um, but at others, right, especially in Chicano histor history narrative, 
uh, contends, no, we don't buy that. Um, you coveted this land. You saw yourself as inherently different and the Mexican authorities as an other. Um, you were likely looking for a pretext to, to, to pull away and coveting that land and you received it with the seven laws constitution. And so, um, yeah, it's hard to avoid conflict history um, when you do this topic of just kind of Norte Americano um, villains and, and, and Chicano victims, right? And so, um, but of course, like I said, uh, I, I try to be as fair and balanced as I can on every topic. Um, and I, I find I want to I want to study gringos like Stephen Austin more thoroughly, because literally for years they demonstrated a loyalty to the Mexican government to. Um, yeah, and and uh, look up another gentleman if you if you wanted to name Abel Stearns, uh, A B E L, and then Stearns, S T E A R N S, and um, he was a, a a gringo businessman in South South um, California, Southern California, uh, who stayed loyal to the Mexican government amidst the Mexican-American War and the Bear Flag Revolt. And then as a, as a contrast to him, is you had another gentleman who, you know, did you see little signs in something as simply symbolic as, um, and perhaps indicative as uh, mestizaje, right? As inter-ethnic marriage and so forth and procreation. Uh, Abel Stearns married a beautiful Mexican woman, um, whereas Thomas Oliver Larkin, L-A-R-K-I-N, he was another one who was highly entrusted uh, with under uh, Governor Castro and Governor Pio Pico and these other uh, big governors, uh, governing authorities of Mexican California. These two gringos were very, very uh, integrated into the upper echelon and were well, um, were trusted, et cetera. But Stearns is going to stay loyal to Mexico and Larkin is going to, is going to um, side with the U.S. and, and, and kind of bite the hand that fed him against Mexican authorities. So I just, to me, I, I love looking at them as, as symbolic of, and I don't know how fair or unfair that is, but looking at such individuals in symbolic fashion to see if there's something we could learn from their, from that, their case, right? And that scenario, et cetera. And so at any rate, you have the loss of Texas, of course, right? Um, at San Jacinto, uh, the American forces are going to um, they're going to follow the art of war, uh, uh, Sun Tzu's art of war, right? Uh, hit the enemy not only where he's weakest, but sometimes where he knows he's strongest because he won't expect it. And so Santa Ana regrouped his army, uh, uh, his three groups together and felt like who would be stupid enough to attack him, right? When all three of his armies had just been united. And that in the midst of that night, that's exactly what Sam Houston's army did. And, uh, and captured Santa Ana and forced him, right? In return for, the, for his person and his personal safety uh, to sign over Texas to them as a Lone Star State. And so Texas remained uh, its own Republic right a unique historical you know um facet to to american history uh from 1836 to 1845 texas was its own state its own country so to speak its own republic and so uh then you have uh the narratives switches from the loss of texas uh, in 1836 to the Mexican-American War in 1848. So 
So during those 12 years, you know, uh, the narrative talks about the Oregon Trail and, uh, and the Santa Fe Trail and the Mormon or California Trail. Uh, you have the, um, you know, multiple books on that. Uh, one standard one that I like to use, the few books if you're ever interested in the future is uh, The American West by John Mac Farragher. Uh, that's a good one. Um, the Oregon Trail by David Derry. I use that one. And I'm always partial to H.W. Uh, Brands, uh, Dreams of El Dorado. He's a good, balanced, but kind of revisionist historian and mm -hmm. showing the dirt on the U.S. Uh, yeah, H.W. Brands. Uh, so, you, you said um, revisionist? Um, yes, revisionist. What yeah. does that mean? So okay. revisionist means, right, that you want to revise the rose-colored court history accounts that praise our government, that praise our leaders, right, that mm -hmm. praises them and justifies everything that they did. So presidents are, were wonderful. Uh, the business leader, robber barons were wonderful, okay, uh, okay. et cetera, right? You, revisionists, you revise it. Okay. And so... Court history, right, contends that Santa Ana was um, uh, tyrannical, that they were fighting for libertarian and liberal political beliefs, not out of racism or coveting that Texas land, right? And revisionists say, no, we don't buy that. And, and revisionist histor history is much more negative. It's much more cynical uh, of our leaders, et cetera. So yeah, so H.W. Brands is a bit revisionist. Uh, he, 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 he shows areas of, of, of racism and discrimination, uh, you know, coveting uh, uh, resources, especially land, et cetera, in his books. And so in the Oregon Trail, right, you have a nice narrative. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and put this up antebellum westward expansion that I refer to every now and then. I'm going to put this up, okay, and you can look at the narrative of, of, um, of the overland trails that I have on number one. All right, and so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post that because I don't want to, I'm trying to save my, um, save my energy. And so since I could have you read that, if you don't mind, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go over that thesis, that particular thesis. But uh, as a Trojan horse, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you have groups like the Spalding Group uh, that went into Oregon, and they were seen as being, you know, um, innocuous, uh, uh, benign, uh, not harmful. Uh, just women and children. Um, families, farmers, teachers, right? And so the, the authorities like Mr. McLaughlin, um, Mr. Laughlin uh, in, in British um, Oregon mm -hmm. said, you know what, these Americans under the Spalding Group, et cetera, they seem to be harmless and they seem to be hardworking and, and good God-fearing people. So let's go ahead and open up the Willamette Valley. And so the Willamette Valley became a place for the uh, Americans to settle in Oregon and with the permission of the British authorities, right? And likewise, very similar to that is the opening in the Sierra Nevada mountains is found in the, um, in the Sacramento Valley, right? Uh, where they put Johann von Suter to be uh, like an impresario, like Stephen Austin was, like a local governor of that area, right? Uh, with police powers uh, to, to, to have um, an economic uh, development uh, take place there, et cetera, et cetera. And we've anglicized his name as John Sutter, right? Uh, and so um, he comes in and the Bidwell Bartleson group uh, sure enough, go through that opening of the mountains of the Sierra Nevada. And they, again, 
they looked um, harmless and also enterprising. And this is Según um, Vallejo, right? Vallejo is the one that says this. And uh, he's the comandante uh, of, the, of the military of, Cal of Mexican California. And um, yeah, he says, you know what? And it's so fascinating when you look at later on, uh, you would not, you don't find just a clear cut regret that you would think you'd find uh, with Vallejo and saying, oh, if I could only go back again and stem the tide of gringos coming into the Sacramento Valley, if I would have just turned back the Bidwell Bartleson group, uh, maybe Mexican California could have remained. Um, but instead, right, he was raised and educated as a cosmopolitan to be a citizen of the whole world and to be open minded and um, and to be divert in a diverse world, et cetera. Uh, his tutors were European uh, and non Hispanic um, uh, uh, in his education, et cetera. And so he kind of has this fatalistic view afterwards. Like, yeah, I probably made a mistake allowing the Green Ghost to settle in large numbers in Sutter's Valley, but, um, but it is what it is, and not, not all bad came out of it. Because, again, he had this idea that the Green Ghosts were enterprising. And enterprising, right, is a generic word for not only hardworking, but you bring new industries with you, right? Mm -hmm. So in... Tejano studies, right, are, are in um, in Chicano studies. Uh, there, this is seen as like a Trojan horse, right? Mm -hmm. Where oh, uh, remember like with the story, right, where the Mycenaeans took Troy, and they mm -hmm. they yeah they brought in this seemingly harmless uh, horse, right, but it had soldiers hidden therein. So likewise, in some Chicano history books. They liken the Bidwell Bartleson group to a Trojan horse. Because afterwards, right, you're going to get ruffians like, um, who did I mention? I mentioned one in particular, uh, Isaac Graham, uh, Ezekiel Merritt, um, other leaders of the, of the, um, the bear flag revolt, um, uh, calling themselves the bears, right? Los Osos. Mm. Uh, see here. Ide. Um, William B. Ide, I D E. So Graham. Ezekiel Merritt. William Ide, et cetera, are some names you could look up if you wanted to as far as leaders of the Bear Flag Revolt. And I just have a common, um, a standard California textbook uh, that I cite on here too called The Elusive Eden. And it's just a textbook on, on California. But it's a good book. It's informative and interesting. Uh, so let's see here. So Mexico will have her own political instability. I give examples of that, that rendered her more um, uh, vulnerable at this time. And yeah, so just take a look at this, if you would. Um, and then of course, the Mexican-American War. I have just the, some of the basics as far as, um, some of the reasons for which the United States won that war militarily, just down to the very basics. But do you have any questions or comments, Miguel? Uh, no, no questions, no comments at the moment, but thank you. No, thank you. All right. Um, you're definitely going to get 10 points. Thank you. Uh, um, you, you certainly have earned it. Yeah, uh, my apologies on the late assignments. 
uh, I've been really busy and I've been trying to like um, get as much work as done possible, but I'll get no, to it's it. Okay. It's okay. okay. And with me, honestly, coming to these Zoom meetings, uh, that 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 demonstrates a lot to me. Yeah. As far as your your the seriousness with which you take the class and so forth. So please, if you can, try to continue to do that. Yeah, of course. Of course. And, thank you. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. uh, appreciate your your uh your faithfulness and coming to these zooms uh, oftentimes in more than one occasion right it's just been you and i so yeah. I, I i doubly appreciate it of course Thank so you. i'm not here talking to myself um there's lately haven't been a lot of students joining the zoom meetings right? no no uh, you know what and i i have a late start class and mm -hmm. I have uh, an American history class and they all have, uh, I bring about a decent number. So I, I can't, I can't put my finger on it. I, I it, it makes me, of course, and in my in inherent desire to, uh, to not feel guilty about things, right? Uh, I like to think that, okay, well, there you have it. My other classes, I'm not doing anything different and I'm having plenty of students come. So it, it, I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that the, the problem or issue is not mine, that just the students aren't, aren't coming, um, uh, knowing that, especially that it's extra credit right. and it's not necessarily required. Uh, I, had one, I had one class last semester, the same situation. Mm. I taught about three or four classes last semester and all of them but one, I had a, a, a good, decent number of participants, uh, except for that one class. And I just kind of eventually um, uh, accepted it. Mm. But if there's something you think that I'm not doing, you know, adequately, uh, if it's a matter of, of the time that I've allotted for us to do this, you know, maybe I, I could send out another announcement and ask the class. Uh, because I, I, I don't mean to sound complacent with it, because it's not a good thing at all. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll do just that. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, I feel it's, it's pretty okay, because um, it's not too late. Uh, Tuesdays after school, you know, I have enough time to like, eat, get some rest, and then just hop back in and uh, join your Zoom meetings. And it's just once a, week, once a week, so I really don't mind it. Um, uh, oh, so you've, um, sorry if I'm taking your time, but no. have you, uh, do you only teach in Delta or have you taught in other schools as well? No, I've taught at other schools as well. Um, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching in Modesto. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have taught uh, at Columbia, uh, a, a, a small junior college uh, in the Sonora area of Northern California. And, um, and I've taught, I taught for a couple of years at, at CSU Stan. Okay. So yeah, I've, I've taught at a few different places. Well, all right, thank you. All right. All right, so you take care, okay? And uh, thank you so much. I appreciate your, um, your attendance. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate All right, it. Miguel. Have a good week, okay? You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.